Well, I'm so glad that you're here today and trust that this will be a great day in your spiritual walk with the Lord, uh, that we will grow today in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ together. And I cannot think of a better subject for us to devote our attention than this subject of the attributes of God, which we began looking at yesterday. When we say the attributes of God, we are referring to those character qualities that belong to God, uh, those marks of His perfections, um, the, the essence and the being of, of Almighty God. And yesterday we began looking at the aseity of God, which is the self-sufficiency of God, that God's existence is grounded in Himself that there is no dependence upon God, upon anything or anyone. In that sense, God is independent. He is not dependent upon us or anything, and it is in Him that we live and move and have our being. We are all dependent upon God physically, spiritually, and in every way. We also considered the spirituality of God. And by that, we mean that God is a spirit being. He is without a corporal body or a physical body. And because God is a spirit, God therefore is immense and infinite and invisible. Uh, It gives credence to His omnipotence, I mean, His omnipresence, that God can be everywhere present because there are no spatial limitations to God. Um, We also considered um, what we called the personality of God, that God has a mind, God has emotions and affections, and God has a will. God is not an it. God is represented as a he with the marks of personality or a person. Uh, God is not a force. God is not an inanimate object. Uh, God is uh, one who possesses a mind. God can think. God can reason. God can scrutinize. Um, God can assess. God can judge. God also has emotions. God loves, God hates, God is pleased with, God is displeased with, God is grieved. Um, A rock cannot be grieved, but God can be. And God has a will. God makes choices. God makes decisions. And His will is over all. We also noted the sovereignty of God yesterday, that God is the supreme one over heaven and earth and hell itself. Uh, Everything is under the feet of God, and God controls everything, not only in the macro, but also in the micro. Uh, God is sovereign despot, king over all. And as R.C. Sproul has said, there are no maverick molecules in the universe. Everything exists to do the bidding of God. And so now today we come to the holiness of God. Um, There is only one attribute of God that is declared around the throne of God day and night, as revealed in Scripture, and that one divine attribute is the holiness of God. The angels around the throne are not crying out, love, 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 though God is love. The angels are not crying out, truth, 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 or wrath, 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 though God is truth and God is wrath. Rather, the angels are crying out and declaring, 
the absolute holiness of God. When we think of God, we must gravitate to His holiness. That the angels cry out, holy, 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 means that God's holiness is elevated to the superlative degree. God is holy, but He is more than just holy. Holy, holy means that God would be holier, but holy, holy, holy means that God is holy, He is holier, He is holiest. He is the single most holy being in the entire universe. There is no attribute with which God is more identified than the holiness of God. Everything about God is holy. His Son is the Holy One of Israel. The Spirit is His Holy Spirit. The Bible is the Holy Word of God. The temple is the holy temple. The land is the holy land. Everything about God is holy. A.W. Pink writes, God only is independently, infinitely, immutably holy. He is the sum of all moral excellency. He is absolute purity unsullied even by the shadow of sin. Holiness, Pink writes, is the very excellency of the divine nature. His holiness is the very antithesis of all moral blemish or defilement. Now, as we consider God's holiness, and we may have spoken of this this past Sunday... It's hard to remember which city I've been in and what I've said where, but I think we may have alluded to it. There's a primary meaning of holiness. There's a secondary meaning of holiness. And we need to understand both the primary and the secondary meaning of holiness if we are to have a right and true knowledge of God. First, the primary meaning of the word holiness which is a separation above his creation. Now, the root word for holy really means to cut, to cut something in half. Like I would take this sheet and cut it in half so that there is now a separation between the two. The idea is that with this separation, God is now vastly separated from us because of the moral perfection of his character. God is absolutely holy, and we are radically corrupt. And there is a vast chasm that separates holy God from sinful man. The word holiness carries the idea to be elevated above God's creatures, to be distinct from, to be different from. He is a cut above us. We're not on his level. He's not on our level. God is high and lifted up. Uh, The idea also is the transcendence of God. And with this transcendence is exalted majesty. God is robed in regal splendor and dazzling in kingly glory as he is high and lifted up and a cut above the works of his hands. The word carries the idea of his supreme greatness compared to all created things. Thomas Watson, the great Puritan, says, holiness is the most sparkling jewel of his crown. There is a sense in which all of the attributes of God come together to comprise his holiness. In that sense, the wholeness of God is his holiness. 
every attribute, every aspect, the sum and the substance of the entire being and perfections of God come together to comprise the elevation of the holiness of God and the revelation of that holiness is His glory. That is why Isaiah 6 verse 3 says, the angels, the seraphim around the throne are crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth is full of His glory. The outshining, the self-revelation of the holiness of God is His intrinsic glory put on display. Let me give you some verses. Exodus 15, verse 11, the Song of Moses. Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is, there is no one like our God. He, he is a cut above unto himself. Now, what defines or what delineates the uniqueness of God, that God is incomparable? He goes on to say in verse 11, It was like you among the gods, O Lord. Who is like you? And now here is the answer. Exodus 15, 11. Majestic in holiness. Awesome in praises. Working wonders. That God is majestic in holiness is the idea that God is stunningly brilliant and beautiful in the radiance of His holiness. He is impressively grand in the display of the perfections of His character. This past summer, I went to the Tower of London and saw the crown jewels of England. To keep the crowd moving, you get on a moving belt that just keeps you moving so that you won't just stop and gaze and back up the line. And to look upon those crown jewels is is breathtaking. It's hard to take it in. Diamonds that large... Diamonds refracting the light above so brilliantly that there is a sense of awe to look upon them. Take that relatively grand illustration, but multiply it 10,000 times 10,000 times 10,000 times 10,000 myriads of myriads. And it would only begin to scratch the surface of the majesty of the holiness of God. Awesome, it says in praises. Awe-inspiring, stunning, staggering, breathtaking, magnificent, mind-boggling, heart-stopping, soul-enlarging jaw-dropping, eye-captivating, pride-crushing, knee-bending, to gaze upon the absolute holiness and purity of God. 1 Samuel 2, 2, there is no one holy like God. He is so high, so exalted, so majestic, so regal. Psalm 22, verse 3, you are holy. Oh, you who are enthroned above upon the praises of of Israel. God is represented as this enthroned king, high and lifted up. 
dressed in splendor and radiance and, and glory. Isaiah 6 verse 1 has already been read, but let us hear it again. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted. That's the idea of transcendence. Exalted, lifted up far above us, far above the works of His hands, enthroned, sitting on a throne, presiding over the universe, holding sway over all, with the train of his robe filling the temple. The greatness of an ancient king was measured by the length of his train. The greater the king, the longer was the train the, 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 that would flow from the, the robe that, that he would wear. And the, extended, the extension of his kingdom would allow for the extension of his robe. And God in heaven is represented here, the train of his robe filling the temple. No one else can even get into the throne room to espouse their sovereignty and holiness. God alone in that throne room. Seraphim, meaning the burning ones. They are on fire for God. They are burning with intense passion and zeal for God. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face. Even the seraphim, realizing they are unworthy to even be in the presence of such an infinitely pure and perfect and holy God, they cover their their face, unable to even look upon this this splendid sovereign, and with two he covered his feet. It was a signi- uh, it signified humility. You remember in Exodus three, as Moses was at the burning bush, and God said to him, "Remove your sandals, for the ground that you stand upon is holy ground. You cannot come just as you are." And these seraphim covering their feet, signifying their humility, recognizing their own, their own unworthiness. And with two wings he flew, like hummingbirds ready to dash, to carry out the bidding and the words of this sovereign king. And one seraphim called out to another. It's an epiphanal effect from one side of heaven to the other side of heaven. Uh, In the States, I go to a football game, and one side of the stadium will call out the name of the school, and the other side of the stadium will respond with that school's mascot. And it'll just go back and forth, back and forth, louder and louder. And, And that is what is taking place here in heaven. One side, the seraphim, holy, holy, holy. The other side crying out, is the Lord God Almighty. One side crying out, the whole earth is full of His glory. They respond back, holy, holy, holy. What a scene. This stately court with royal attendants and kingly servants. God separated, set apart, splendid. Even in heaven, as we stand before the throne, there will be a separation from us and God, even in our glorified state. Here is the outshining of God's holiness brighter than 10,000 suns in the sky above. Isaiah 57, 15. For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I dwell on a high and holy place. The church today sees God in a much lower state. 
God is my buddy. God is cool. God is a dude. God is low. And whenever the church has stood the strongest, and whenever the saints of God have risen up to leave their mark on their generation, they have returned to the high ground of standing upon this confession of the holiness of God and to see that God is high and lifted up. It affects worship. It affects the way we live. It affects everything about us. It affects our attitudes. It affects our mind, our thought life. It has a radical effect upon our lives. This is the primary meaning of the word holiness. That God is a cut above. God is separated from us. God is high and lifted up. And there is a vast chasm that separates holy God from sinful man. It also magnifies the grace of God that God has spanned this vast chasm through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the higher we understand God to be and the lower we understand ourselves to be, the more we magnify the grace of God in the cross of Christ. The more we lower God and the more we elevate man, the more we minimize and even trivialize the grace of God in the cross. So, what we want for our lives, for our ministries, for our church, for our worship, is to recognize God for who He is in His holiness. Now, second, the secondary meaning of the word for holiness is separation from moral pollution. It means that God is set apart from all that is unclean and all that is evil and positively that he is set apart unto that which is morally pure and without blemish and is flawless. When I cut this piece of paper in half and separated them, there's a twofold separation horizontally that's taking place. God is separated from all that is the antithesis of his character, and God is set apart unto that which conforms to himself. Charles Hodge, the great Princeton theologian, writes concerning the moral perfection of God's holiness. This is a general term for the moral excellence of God. Holiness implies entire freedom from moral evil and absolute moral perfection. Freedom from impurity is the primary idea of the word. To sanctify is to cleanse, to be holy, to be clean. Infinite purity belongs to God alone. So it is the moral purity of God that all of God's thoughts are pure and perfect. All of God's emotions are pure and perfect. All of God's choices 
and determinations of his will are pure and perfect. All of God's judgments are perfect. All of God's ways are perfect. All of God's renderings are perfect. God's will is perfect. Everything about God is untainted by any imperfection. Leviticus 11 in verse 44, God says, I am holy. In Psalm 5 verse 4, the psalmist writes, You are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes, meaning to stand with approval. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. It's the holiness of God. There's more to the story than God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. God is angry with the wicked every day. Jonathan Edwards preached a sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And God is angry with the wicked every day because of His perfect holiness. He is repulsed by everything that is impure and unclean before his eyes. Psalm 11 in verse 4, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked. And the one who loves violence, his soul hates Upon the wicked he will rain snares, fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. God must hate all of that which does not conform to his own holy character. God cannot compromise sin. Habakkuk 1 verse 13, your eyes are too pure to approve evil. The idea is God cannot wink at evil. God cannot just look the other way. God knows too much. And God is too holy. He cannot... Your eyes are too pure to approve evil. And you cannot look on wickedness with favor. How pure is God's holiness... Matthew 5, verse 48 says, You are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Moral perfection. 1 John 1, 5, God is light. And in Him, there is no darkness at all. No moral blemish. No moral flaw. And when we come to the end of the Bible in Revelation 4, verse 8, we are given another gaze into the throne room of God as a door is opened in heaven and John is caught up and allowed to enter into the throne room of God, his body on the island of Patmos, his soul and spirit caught up into the throne room of God And the first thing he sees is not streets of gold or gates of pearl or who else is there or who else is not there or the heavenly chorus. The first thing that he notes is there is a throne standing in heaven. And him who sat upon the throne, he is immediately absorbed with this throne standing fixed in heaven, occupied, and one upon this throne, exercising all of the prerogatives that belong to the one who sits upon this throne, and flashes of fire are coming from
forth. It's not a casual worship service going on in heaven. And four living creatures, literally the four living ones, four angelic beings, guardian angels, guarding the throne of God. No one can just come up flippantly to the throne. A separation. And the angels are crying out, holy, holy, holy. This is the holiness of God. All of heaven throughout all of the ages to come, recognizing the absolute holiness of Almighty God. And in this throne room scene, from the throne proceeded flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. There's a gathering storm in heaven that will break upon the earth in the last days. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. Even in heaven, this sea of glass sealing off God unto himself, separating glorified saints from holy God. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures, four living ones, full of eyes in front and behind on constant vigil, guarding the holiness of God. And the first creature was like a lion, the second like a calf, the third had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle, and the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings. Sound familiar? With two, they cover their face, unable to even gaze upon His holiness. With two, they cover their feet, recognizing they are unworthy to be in the presence of such a holy God. And with two, they flew with full of eyes around and within, and day and night, they do not cease to say, holy, holy, holy. Is the Lord God the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come? The one who has always been this holy. The one who remains the holiest. And the one who shall be forever the holiest. What effect should this have upon our hearts towards God? What effect should this have upon our worship of God? All too often, the church wants to be like the world in worship, when instead we should be like heaven in our worship of God. This should grip our hearts and lay hold of us that this God has invited us to come to him through the only way by which we may have access before his holy throne in heaven. Not by our good works and not by our empty religion, but exclusively and only through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. As God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There is only one way, and it is not through Buddha. It is not through Allah. 
It is not through Muhammad. It is not through Brigham Young. It is through Jesus Christ alone. And to think that there are many ways to God, a person would be ignorant of two things. You don't know how holy God is. And you don't know how sinful you are. And if you had any comprehension of how holy God is and how defiled you are, you would understand that there is only one way for radically corrupt, totally depraved rebels to come into the presence and find acceptance with an infinitely holy God. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. God has made the only one true living way to come into his holy presence. And that is through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, who alone can make sinners clean. God said through the prophet Isaiah, Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as wool. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has laid the iniquity of us all upon him. It is only through the power that is in the blood and the substitutionary sin-bearing death of Jesus Christ can sinners approach a holy God in heaven. That's the holiness of God. I want us to talk second today about the omnipresence of God. I want to just start on the omnipresence of God, and then we'll take a break in just a couple of minutes. As we think about the omnipresence of God, it is one of these attributes that we just cannot wrap our mind around it. John Calvin wrote, The finite cannot contain or grasp the infinite. For our minds to grasp the fullness of the omnipresence of God would be like trying to pour the Atlantic Ocean into a little cup. It's just not going to fit. Whoever the smartest of us is in this room can only contain just a little cup of the ocean of the fullness of God. Omnipresence, the word omni means all. And there are three attributes that begin with omni. Omnipresence, omniscience, and omnipotence. They cluster together very beautifully with the prefix to each of these words. Omnipresence means that God is all-present. Omniscience means that God is all-knowing, and omnipotence means that God is all-powerful. Well, let's begin with the omnipotence, excuse me, the omnipresence of God. Several things this means. Number one, 
He is everywhere present. Because God is a spirit, he is not restricted to a bodily form. If God was one encompassed by a material body, then he would be spatially limited to one place, one pinpoint on the map of the universe. But because God is spirit, there is no restriction to the presence of God, and God fills up every place with the fullness of all that he is. God is everywhere present, and God is everywhere present with the fullness of all of his being. Psalm 139, verse 7, David writes, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? Rhetorical questions, the answer to these is nowhere. The answer is so obvious, David does not even bother to answer the question. No matter where you and I will go for the rest of our lives... God is already there. He says, I will never, never leave you nor forsake you. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? Verse 8, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, referring to the grave, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, that's to go to the east. The sun rises in the east. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the earth, uh, of the sea, the Mediterranean Sea was to the west of David. North heaven, south grave, east the rising of sun, to the depths of the sea to the west. North, south, east, west. No matter where I go, even there, your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. There is no escaping the presence of God. Life or death, land or sea, God is everywhere present. That is very comforting and that's very convicting. His eyes are in every place. His ears are in every conversation. When I went to college, I I grew up in a town called Memphis, Tennessee. When I went to college, I went to college what was for me a long ways away, way out in West Texas, in the middle of nowhere. Went out to play football at a major college. There were about 30,000 people on campus. I did not know one person on campus. And as I would sit in my dorm room, and this was before the days of cell phone, there there really was a time on the earth when there (laughs) there were no cell phones. Back before the flood, there were... There were no cell phones. There was a little pay phone at the end of my dorm hall where you could go call home. And my dad gave me a little allowance, and I didn't have enough money really to call home and do other things. So I was very alone. And I remember one weekend, I was involved with a bunch of other football players to go out into churches and have a witness. I was simply going to go give a prayer at a little church in the middle of nowhere. It was a tiny little town. There was a Methodist church on one side of the road, a Baptist church on the other side of the road, and they had one preacher. And one week they were Baptists, and the next week they were Methodists. And I was there on Baptist Sunday. (laughs) 
And as I walked in, the pastor said, we're so glad you're here. I've told everyone a football player is coming, and we're so glad you're going to bring the morning message. I said, there must be some mistake. You must be thinking of coffee, not me. (laughs) I said, I've never given a message in my life. I was scared spitless in high school to give in a speech class, to even stand in front of a little tiny class and give verbal directions on how to get to the public library. I said, I'll give a prayer and that's all I can give. So it came time for me to give my prayer and the pastor stood in the pulpit and he said, Steve Lawson, dun da dun da dun da dun will now come. I got up out of my pew and walked forward to the pulpit and he said, Steve Lawson will now bring the morning sermon. (laughs) And just smiled at me. (laughs) He was being a Methodist to me. (laughs) And as I stepped into the pulpit like I'm standing right here, all I had was I had a living Bible. New Testament only, with pictures. (laughs) I've never been in a Bible-preaching church. I've never been in a church like you attend. And so I had been in my dorm room pouring over my Bible, marking it up. And I came to that verse in Hebrews 13, I will never leave you nor forsake you. At that moment, that was the best news I had ever heard. That I was not alone. That God is with me. And that's far more important than having my friends with me. Is to have almighty, holy God with me. And there was a sense in my heart that God plus one makes a majority. And if God is with me, and if God is for me, who can be against me? So, I've never preached. I've never spoken. I've been the quarterback of the football team and called the plays in the huddle. But I opened my mouth and began to preach my first sermon. And all I knew to say was to reinforce and say in different ways that God is always with us wherever we go. I wasn't a theologian. I wasn't anything except a believer in Christ. What an encouragement that should be to you and to me. That when you go to work, when you go back home, when you go to school, that God is omnipresent. And that was also a great restraint on my spiritual life. As I had football teammates getting into all kinds of immoral trouble. To know God is in every restaurant. God is in every movie. God is in every bedroom. God is in every conversation. And that sobered me and had a way of keeping me pure beyond what I would have been otherwise. When we come back from the break, we'll expand this a little bit more that God is everywhere present. And I want to talk about not only is God in heaven, but God is also everywhere on the earth. God is even in hell, inflicting the wrath upon unbelievers.